Hello, everybody. Imagine an internet where AI doesn't cause so much trouble that it does today. Imagine an internet where AI truly benefits everybody in an equal way. What would that look like? It's easy to complain about the problems, but now it's maybe time to envision a new future where we create the internet that we actually want to see. Maybe such an internet would look like AIs where discrimination doesn't occur. Or maybe the AIs wouldn't take up so much electricity consumption. Maybe they wouldn't spread misinformation. Maybe certain AIs wouldn't exist in the first place. Good afternoon, my name is Daphne Miller. And after my keynote, you will know how an open source project like Nextcloud is trying to navigate the space of AI in the midst of the chat GPT hype. How can we do so without giving up on our free software values? And you will also know why there might be an important change happening right now in our essential understanding of what free software means and what the scope of free software should be. I work for Nextcloud, I'm really proud to work for them. And just out of curiosity, who in this room knows Nextcloud already? Oh my god, that's nearly everybody. <laughs> for those of you who don't know Nextcloud, it's a, an open source online productivity tool. So it's a bit similar to Microsoft 365. So you have like online file storage, and you can do video conferencing, online document editing, and others, uh, other functionality. And I lead in Nextcloud a team of developers. They are really amazing, and we integrate Nextcloud with other software that people may use in parallel. And this includes the recent AI softwares that are popping up because our users are using AI in parallel to Nextcloud and then it makes sense to kind of offer them a bridge in their user experience. In my free time, I do academic research to the future of the technology industry and more specifically, how this industry could look like if it were to respect privacy. And in this keynote, I'm gonna try to combine these two fields. But I haven't always been interested in privacy and ethical technology. Let me tell you about a time when I was a total privacy newbie. I was actually really excited about everything big tech. I was working as a consultant and one specific project totally changed my views. So it was this project for a customer who was an LED screen manufacturer. So they were manufacturing LED screens. And they came to us with a new exciting ID that they wanted to bring in the market. And the ID was smart wayfinding poles. So they are like normal wayfinding poles that you can find all around the city to give you directions and street names. But this one came with extra bells and whistles, like uh, Wi-Fi routers and security cameras and microphones and, and also, wait for it, pollen detectors. So you could measure the amount of pollen in the air. And this was in 2016, so Cambridge Analytica didn't happen yet and privacy was not such a topic yet. But I realized that I didn't want to live in a world where every uh, direction pole in the street has surveillance cameras on it. And my colleagues were also uncomfortable with it. And I remember one of my colleagues trying to raise this to the customer's management. And he was like, um, have you heard of GDPR? And GDPR, no one knew about it yet. The client was clueless and he was, my colleague was like, well, it's, Basically, this new law about personal data, it will be enforced in two years, and it would kind of mean that your entire concept will be illegal. The only thing that you could still do is measure the pollen in the air. <laughs> so yeah, we were suddenly left with super fancy pollen detectors, who knew that privacy could be such a buzzkill. But I realized that there is a pattern here, a lot of innovators are collecting a lot of data just because. There is no real reason. They are just doing it because it sounds cool. And 
then I found myself in an interesting position and I started reading Wikipedia articles about privacy and the Wikipedia article turned into a book and suddenly I realized that all this data collected is actually causing real harm to real people today. And this was a dilemma for me because I was studying at the Technical University in Eindhoven and the motto of my department was literally to solve societal problems through the design of smart services, products and systems. And I wanted to know how, it, how is that going to work because I suddenly knew that all these technologies were maybe causing more problems than they were actually solving. So to settle this, I uh, had to do my master thesis and I asked my professor if I could do the thesis about privacy. I wanted to understand if we could fill the design briefs that we were given with different ways that don't violate people's privacy. But there were a few obvious problems uh, and they were mainly political. So my mentor was working for Google, which was a political problem, and the professor who had to assess me was a professor in big data. And he had been doing decades of research to the wonderful possibilities of big data, and I came in as a young woman saying, hello, I have a different idea, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't do this. So yeah, the project got stuck in the beginning, I wasn't allowed to continue for a while, but in the end uh, I got to my PhD, to my master defense, and I presented a portfolio of products that of course showed that all the issues could also be solved in different ways and I published a paper about it, but the professor was not happy. I remember that he said in the question around Daphne, you are trying to throw away the baby with the bathwater. And with that he meant that I wasn't giving this wonderful idea of big data a fair chance. But I'm not so keen on babies, so I answered, well, whether that's a problem depends on the baby. Yeah, maybe it's a very annoying baby or something. And then I took it a bit more extreme and I said, well, maybe it's baby Hitler. <laughs> and then I realized that the whole argument of the professor was totally pointless. Because we are not talking about a baby here. We were talking about a fully grown up adult of decades old. Because he is very old and he was already researching this idea since his master thesis. So this was not a baby, this was not a totally fresh idea. And I said, I'm sorry, your baby is a full grown adult. And this adult has proven itself. And it's structurally violating human rights. And it's disrupting democratic elections. We just had Cambridge Analytica. So I said it's time to throw away this grown-up adult away with the bathwater and choose a different discourse. And I passed the graduation. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> but then the realization came to me that maybe the root cause of issues like surveillance capitalism kind of stem from people like this professor. People who are so passionate and so enthusiastic about what big tech has to offer and they are totally blinded by the downsides of it. And they are kind of unwilling to reflect on that. It's a taboo. And the issues that we face with privacy today are similar to the issues that we face with artificial intelligence today. In the sense that basically it's technology that goes far beyond the limits of general accepted decency and this technology even violates human rights and still we think we shouldn't limit its wonderful possibilities because of the theoretical potential that this idea has in the future. And if I assume that the root cause is basically a lack of values then what would artificial intelligence look like if it were to be done by people with strong values? And I'm proud to see this happen live at Nextcloud because Nextcloud is facing kind of a dilemma now with ChatGPT. Nextcloud is really a value sensitive place. Uh, the people have really strong values, they are very humble, a lot of reflection takes place. 
I have never worked with such a bunch of passionate and talented people. But there is trouble in paradise. Because ChatGPT doesn't resonate well with Nextcloud. Of course, it's an interesting technological invention to, to generate your timesheets faster, or to say no to your boss in an elegant manner, or to generate slides from your presentation, which I didn't do. Um, but it is also a legal invention. It is a legal invention to bypass copyleft open source licenses. ChatGPT is basically an invention for license laundering. So what does it mean for open source to engage in this field of AI that is basically anti-open source? Well, my observation so far is that it's like mixing oil and water, or like mixing cats and cucumbers. You just get chaos. And especially because OpenAI, the organization behind ChatGPT, is kind of redefining what it means to be open. Because if you talk with people who are not active in free software, they believe that OpenAI does a great, does a great job in openness. And they are really known for that. But ChatGPT is entirely proprietary. And other softwares that they produce too, like for example, DALI, uh, yes, they opened the API, and yes, they published a research paper about the ecosystem, but they never published the code, so people had to crack the code themselves. And this, is, this doesn't have anything to do with the original concept of openness in free software. So, um, this also made me reflect that because the boundaries of openness are kind of reducing, the incentives for researchers who are studying this technology are also changing. And they seem to focus only on arbitrary things like performance or trying to crack the code. But in my opinion, the real problems with AI are therefore left unstudied. For example, if we would have access to the data set, then we could do very interesting analysis on whether bias is occurring or whether the work of artists has been stolen. But this is not possible, so the boundaries that OpenAI puts on their software is changing researcher incentives. And this is of course a dilemma for Nextcloud, because on the one hand, there are very clear reasons to stay away from all this bullshit and just assume that it's so unethical and it's limiting user freedom, let's stay away from it. But on the other hand, ChatGPT is kind of taking over our market. We are competing with Microsoft. So if Microsoft starts to offer these services in the future and we want these users to switch to our software, they will expect similar functionality from us. So we have been reflecting over the last months, how can we um, be okay with this new um, hype in our market. Um, can we kind of make uh, requirements for AI? With what kind of AI would we be comfortable? Uh, are there perhaps open source communities out there that do, in our opinion, a good job that we could collaborate with? And the Nextcloud product management basically came up with a very simple framework with three technical requirements. What I call the framework ethical AI. We will talk about whether that's appropriate or not in a minute. But the three requirements are first of all that the code has to be open source. And not only the finished code, but also the code that's used to train the model. Secondly, the finished trained model has to be freely available so that you could run it on your own machine, so that you don't have to compromise your data. And third, the training data has to be available, because only then you can study if bias occurred or if copyrights are stolen. And then the question was, can we create software that kind of meets these requirements, or can we integrate with open source projects who meet these requirements? So the first question I asked my, my team was, which functionality do we actually need? Because as an online collaboration tool, we obviously don't need all the features of ChatGPT. 
unless we're going to become an AI company, which we don't want to do, you don't need everything. So we thought, okay, maybe you want to be able to summarize long emails, maybe you want to be able to generate some text or documents, maybe you want to be able to generate fitting memes from your chat message, but maybe that's about it. And then we realized that maybe there are already machine learning applications that are already widely spread that we don't offer, for example, uh, the options to machine translation or the options to transcribe video calls. So I said, okay, let's just catch up with those things first. Let's try to catch up with transcription and translation. The translation feature we are quite proud of because it seems to meet all our requirements. So the um, translation feature is built in our text app so you can select some text and then quickly translate the content. And as I said, it meets all our requirements. So the data is available, the finished model can run on your own machine and the code is fully available. The second integration we made for the transcription is unfortunately a solution that we are slightly less proud of because we integrated with Whisper and Whisper's training data is not open. But it was kind of the best solution that we could find and to our knowledge there are no very good uh, open source models available that deliver an equal user experience. And this was an interesting discussion because on the one hand we were feeling that this technical implementation limits user freedom because it's not fully open. But on the other hand, there are also ethical concerns for not integrating Whisper. Because that would mean we don't have transcription and video calls, which means that video calls are less accessible to people with hearing disabilities. So we decided to still go for it anyway and hope that the open source community will maybe come up with better solutions that could replace Whisper in the future. But with Whisper it does show a limitation um, of our AI strategy because as long as Nextcloud doesn't want to create their own AI we are kind of dependent on what the open source community will do. And we are dependent on how the open source community understands free software and we can't necessarily decide for them what to do. Um, and this became very apparent when we were researching alternatives to ChatGPT uh, because many of the alternatives are not fully open. There are, I've seen alternatives that are pretty much illegal. They say they are open source, but they train the model on outputs of ChatGPT, which the terms of service of ChatGPT do not allow. And we have also uh, researched Open Assistant, but the data of Open Assistant is not open yet. Yes, they do promise they will open it in the future, but they are very vague about their timeline. And to be honest, I don't think it will ever become open. Because the reason they are hiding it from us now is because they know that they have something to hide. So unless people are working really hard on fixing that, which I don't believe, we will never see it open. Maybe I'm too critical, maybe uh, I, they deserve some more trust, but maybe I'm still traumatized with what happened to SNPs. Do you remember the voice assistant that would become open source? They had a very dedicated community and they had for a long time uh, on their website that the proprietary parts of their software would become open source soon. Well, I checked, it's still on their website. SNPs will become open source soon, but it got sold to Sonos. This will not become open source soon. That's bullshit. I feel that the uh, definition of free software is kind of at a fork at the moment. It can go two ways. Either the definition of free software changes in the way that OpenAI wants it to change. And code would not longer be possible to study in the future or make modifications or run it yourself. And in the other direction, I think the definition of free software will also change. Because if we think about what user freedom means in times where we see the issues of AI, we might want to question, does user freedom also mean freedom from discrimination? 
or does user freedom also mean that software needs to be energy efficient? Or does user freedom also mean freedom from misinformation? Let me explain this a little bit more. When my uh, product management was thinking about this ethical AI framework for Nextcloud, I was a little bit afraid that the framework would become very technocratic. Uh, as you see, the requirements are also fully technical, right? It's only about open source, but does open source mean that it's ethical? For me, those concepts don't fully overlap. I can totally imagine fully unethical open source software. So I was thinking, what could we do more? Can we do even more to guarantee free software? And, um, well, as I said, I do academic research, so on a rainy Sunday morning, I decided to do some literature research in the field of ethical AI. And I declined a PhD in ethical AI after my graduation, because I felt it was a pointless field. I felt the field only existed to ethics wash big tech. Because there was this taboo on deciding when AI is simply not a good idea. There was a taboo on deciding when we should not do AI. And instead, the researchers were expected to come up with frameworks or things to discuss and reflect on the ideas. But why do we have to reflect if we don't want to make decisions anyway? So for me, ethical AI was like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. It's pointless, you don't have to waste your time on that. But nevertheless, on the rainy Sunday morning, I was hopeful. And I thought maybe uh, these researchers came up with some brilliant ideas. Let's give it a try. Well, after two cups of coffee, I still didn't find anything useful. So I called a professor that I like to work with. His name is Professor Dineen. He's a professor in information sciences and ethical AI. So I asked him, yeah, can we have a video call? And uh, of course he said yes. And within the first minute, he directly skipped to slide number 17. He skipped all the others. He said, you don't need to know the details. This is all you need to know about ethical AI. And he started complaining. He said, these, these models, these frameworks, they are hopelessly high level. They basically say, you are required to do the good thing. But what is the good thing? They don't really answer it. He continued, and there are toolkits that you can use, but they are often behind the paywall, so they are trying to hide them away from us. He was very unhappy. He also said none of these frameworks are ever evaluated by other researchers. None of these frameworks are ever used in practice. He said, I don't see the point of it. And also, they vary in scope, they are all different, you can combine frameworks, it's a mess. Yeah, and the Beamer also gives up, that's what I expected. <laughs> that's why I was early. <laughs> well, we will do without slides then. Oh, it's back. So yeah, these frameworks weren't really useful, I realized that my assumption was correct. Ethical AI in the academic field is about as useful as a unicorn's diet plan. Totally impractical. Um, back to my apple. Um, so then I thought, but how hard can it really be to just make up our minds about what we don't want to do with AI? And last December, I was invited to give a lecture about ethics uh, at the University of Amsterdam. And it was a crowd of about 180 master students in the track of artificial intelligence. And I thought, let's just try to settle with these kids the question when AI is a stupid idea. But then the professor came to me about 10 minutes before I started. Yeah, Daphne, you want a tough job if you want to achieve that, because yeah, listen, these kids never had an ethics class in their entire life. And I thought, uh-oh. We are teaching people about AI, but we are not teaching them about ethics. But I was still hopeful, and I thought, let's just start with an example that everybody will agree upon. And I started with an example from criminality. So there's a lot of government softwares that apply risk scores 
to kind of figure out how we can prevent criminality or how we can prevent terrorism. And I started with a story uh, about a vision report of the Dutch police that got leaked. The report was written around 2011 and got leaked a few years later. And the report had to describe how the Dutch police wants to keep up with the rising levels of criminality. Um, but unfortunately, the entire report was only about technology and surveillance. So the title was Vision on Sensing in a Networked Society. And it described what sensors are and how you can connect them. And also what you could do with algorithms and that you could then eventually predict weird behavior. And then you could even intervene before the crime is committed. What could possibly go wrong? It's like the, the film uh, Minority Report where Tom Cruise has to run because of a crime he might commit in the future. And then I continued to the students that I also wondered how much budget the police had for this project. Because a simple app that the Dutch government developed for Corona the Corona Melder app uh, already costed 23 million euros. So I said, I wonder how much this madness, madness costs. And then I asked the students, what would you do if you would have access to such budget? And I continued with some ideas from social sciences that I would implement. For example, I showed them this um, uh, research about how Norwegian prisons had been redesigned uh, so they treat the inmates well, they give them job training, and they kind of figured out a way to make sure they get out in the same way, so that they can participate in society again. And the recidivism rate dropped by 43%. And then I showed the students another project, sorry for the amount of text, but it's uh, what the uh, police in Aarhus did in Denmark. And they managed to reduce the number of traveling jihadists by 97%. So nearly everybody. And they did so with using a new vision of what criminality is about. They said, well, it starts with understanding that radicalization roots from discrimination. So they are treating these people in a different way. They strengthen the social networks of these young people instead of putting up more punishments. And it really worked. So I said to the students, if we genuinely want the police to be able to keep up with rising levels of criminality, then we maybe our goal is to make people behave more sane. And if we want people to behave more sane, then we should invest in human sanity rather than artificial intelligence. <laughs> But then one of the students raised a hand. They had a question. And the student said, yeah, um, I worked for this project of the Dutch police as an intern. <laughs> I said, okay. And the student said, is it really that bad? And I said, well, you obviously already know my opinion. Um, but what, what's your opinion? And the answer was like, but what if this is really going to work well? What if this is really going to help the police to solve crimes much faster? And I realized that this argument is the same as the argument of my professor during my master defense. It's basically accusing me of being against progress. It's basically accusing me of not giving this new idea a fair chance, even though this new idea already had their fair chance. And it's just a little bit off, right? If you have the money and the power to create an AI that's never going to work, then you also have the money and the power to put your resources into something more useful. Let that sink in for a bit while I drink a sip of water. This whole discussion makes me think a little bit about the terraforming Mars project. You know, this crazy idea where Elon Musk has a plan. Uh oh, yeah. 
and it's basically about adding atmosphere on Mars so that humans could colonize the planet. And if you have the resources to terraform Mars, then you also have the resources to make Earth a better place. And what's happening with AI is exactly the same. We are consistently putting our resources on the wrong planet. And that is unethical in my opinion. So as long as we are producing AIs for stupid applications, the AI is unethical by default. Talking about taking care of this planet, I am not 100% sure, well actually I'm quite sure that the ideas of AI are not compatible with humanity's largest challenge, which is climate change. The global internet usage emits as much uh, greenhouse gases as the global airline industry. And this is recently a lot in the Netherlands in the news because in the Netherlands there are many data centers of uh, big tech companies like Google, Microsoft and Facebook. And not many people realize it, but all the files that you store in the cloud and all the videos that you browse on TikTok uh, and ChatGPT, they all need to run on servers. And we call these servers the cloud. And the cloud sounds like this magic fluffy place where the sun always shines. But in reality, it's rainy places like as rainy as Gothenburg, for example, the Wieringer Meer. That's this spot in the Netherlands where nobody wants to live. It's far away from Amsterdam, as you can see, at least half an hour drive. <laughs> and these data centers are often next to places where they generate uh, renewable energy. In the Wieringer Meer, there is the largest wind park we have in the country. It has 82 windmills of 180 meters high, and the wind park produces electricity for 370,000 households. And now I have a question for you. For how many households does this wind park actually deliver energy? It's zero. Exactly, it's zero. Let me explain. Big Tech loves to put their servers in the Netherlands. And there are some reasons for that. We almost never have war. We are a tax haven. We rarely have natural disasters. We have a relatively stable government. Of course, it's attractive for the taxes. We have a large internet exchange point, very fast internet. For the taxes, it's a great idea. <laughs> but there is another problem, and that is that Big Tech is very well aware of their energy consumption. And thus, they thought, okay, we need to be carbon neutral, all for a better world or to protect your corporate image. And strangely enough, the municipality is very proud of their deal because all the energy of this wind park um, from Waterfall uh, went to a data center of Big Tech. And they are very proud of that. The major even was bragging in the news like, yeah, we went all the way to Seattle for the negotiations with Microsoft. Um, and then in the local news, it was also announced in a funny way. They were saying that the Middermeer could become Silicon Valley of Europe. And then he continued that the private jets of Microsoft Steve Ballmer would stay here. And of course, Bill Gates. No, sorry, big tech fanboy. I don't <laughs> think Bill Gates will visit Wieringermeer. And of course, the citizens are screwed, right? Because they thought that the energy would be for them. But everybody in the Netherlands is screwed because these wind parks are built with subsidies from the Dutch government. 660 million euros went to this wind park in subsidies. And this is not a unique story because in Zeewolde something similar happened where we have data centers that consume twice as much the amount of energy of the entire city of Amsterdam. And it also happened in Eemshaven, where Google invested in a data center. Uh, they did, of course, so in a way so that it's attractive for the taxes. So they uh, bought the land and directly sold it to a company in Luxembourg. And now they rent it back. And I have another riddle for you. Whom of these people just announced the deal with Google? 
I think the left person. So the next question is, what could Nextcloud do to reduce their energy consumption? Because we are part of the problem as well. Um, and I have a few ideas about them, but not all of them might be great, so let's try it out. The first question I have for you is, do you know this feature in most email softwares that they kind of mark which email is important for you? In some mails it's called priority inbox or their important mail. Do you know what I'm talking about? Whom of you is just like me not using this? You see that everyone. And Nextcloud Mail has this as well. But it's running on a machine learning algorithm. And therefore I think that it's probably quite energy consuming and nobody is using it. So if we want to reduce the amount of energy that our software needs, Maybe the first and most obvious step would be to do user research and deprecate features that are poorly adopted. And the second idea that I have is to have a look at which features are currently created through machine learning algorithms that could also be simple regular expressions. Uh, an example I have is a feature in Nextcloud for security, so the use case is that users want to prevent people from other countries in other time zones to log into your Nextcloud. And it's used using a machine learning algorithm, but I think this could also be an if-else statement, because why can't I just select that I don't want anybody who doesn't live in the Netherlands to log in? Or why can't I select that nobody is allowed to log in between, I don't know, 1 and 4 in the night? And then you're done. Well, maybe the developers have excellent reasons why this uh, idea of me doesn't work, and I'm sure they are valid. But my point is also valid, namely that we can rethink which features don't really need machine learning. Let's keep it simple. Ironically, the opposite is also happening. We have some very elegant if-else statements in Nextcloud that could have been machine learning, and they are also marketed as intelligence features. And I hope that we can break through this nonsense in the future, because I believe we have to be proud on finding elegant and simple solutions. In the end, users don't really care about how the software is built, in the end they just want a reliable solution that works for them. Um, so let's, let's keep software simple. And I also believe that there are features that do need machine learning and that are useful, but only in very specific use cases. Um, the most obvious example I can think of is perhaps background clearing during video calls. There are specific use cases where background clearing is very helpful. For example, if your boss is calling you, but you are sitting in your bed with your laptop propped up on some pillows, then you want background blurring. But background blurring is also very energy consuming. So maybe in the future, developers would consider to move background blurring a little bit away, eh, that you have to access it through a few clicks. Maybe we would also explain to users that this is energy consuming and that you shouldn't use it by default for every video call that you have. And a similar implementation we did with my team for the Whisper integration that I talked about earlier, the transcription feature. Um, so they have different models of accuracy that you could use. And we decided to not enable the most accurate model by default and instead we enabled the media model by default and explained to the administrators that uh, the more accurate the model is, the more resources the implementation needs and that you should choose an option that fits your use case. Next to energy consumption, there is another problem where I believe the open source community could do a much better job than big tech. And that's maybe a topic that doesn't interest everybody in this room, but it's about discrimination. It is, there is big consensus that any AI that is trained on public data is likely to discriminate or have bias. 
So what we did with the recognized IPNX cloud, which recognizes, for example, faces, is that we compiled the data set of diverse people and tested the implementation on uh, things like racism before we deployed it. And I really hope that this becomes standard practice in the future. And another thing we are considering with the team is to add the possibility of a feedback loop after the AI is deployed. So perhaps a button in the UI where if a user uh, experiences discrimination that they can reach out to us in a way that is more accessible than GitHub. Um, so that we can create the possibility for the developer to stay accountable also after the product launch. As I said, I believe the free software community is kind of in a fork right now. On the one hand, under the influence of AI, our definition of free software might change and we might start to become more tolerant towards code that is not free and that we can't really study or adjust or distribute. That's the future that OpenAI wants. But I believe that the other road also leads us to a new definition of free software. Because we have to rethink what does it mean to give freedom to users in the age of AI. Should it include statements about discrimination? Should it include statements about producing simple software and avoiding machine learning where possible? Should it include statements about energy usage? And a more important question is perhaps when should software not exist in the first place? Because even if we adjust our definition, even if we become more sensitive to issues that are maybe not our issues directly, then still software isn't guaranteed to be ethical. We cannot say that open source equals ethics. For example, picture this. Picture that ChatGPT would go open source. It would still mean that the way ChatGPT is developed is highly unethical because they deployed uh, workers from Kenya, Kenya and they heavily underpaid them and had them review traumatizing content to make ChatGPT less, less toxic. Even if ChatGPT would be fully open, this wouldn't be called ethical. Or imagine that TikTok or Instagram goes open source. Even with the added transparency, the function of the software remains the same. Namely, to hook you up and to fill your head with fake news and spread weird ideas of what your body should look like. The software is never going to be ethical. And of course, we also have to talk about software used by governments to assign risk profiles to people that basically make us live in a scoring society. One of the examples I showed to the students in Amsterdam is the software North Point, which is used by American judges to assign risk scores to criminals to know how likely they will commit crime again, and they adjust the punishment based on this risk score. However, researchers found that it was only accurate in 61% of the time. And I mean seriously, 61%? I have seen horoscopes that are more accurate than this. <laughs> you know that you are in trouble when your AI algorithm has an equal accuracy rate as just flipping a coin. And it is also discriminating, so people who are black have a much higher chance to get an unjustly high risk score, and people who are white, white get a much lower risk score. And even if this software were to be open source, Maybe it would perform a little bit better, but it still shouldn't exist in the first place. So the question is, can we include in the definition of free software also a statement about what software we shouldn't build in the first place? And I would like to start a thought experiment, which is an idea that I got from Dana on Mastodon, and she wrote, my wife says that anytime someone proposes to do anything with a machine learning model, you should replace AI in the proposal with trained weasel. And if it still sounds like a good idea, you can go ahead with it. This is a weasel. I just wanted to include a picture of a cute weasel. 
but it's kind of brilliant, right? I joke to my boss that maybe it could be an April Fool's joke to say that we replaced the ethical AI framework of Nextcloud with the weasel test. But he said, yeah, it's actually quite a clever idea. That shouldn't be an April Fool's joke. We can maybe do that in reality. Uh, and since then, we are kind of replacing any proposal about AI with the trained weasels. So you have to keep in mind if you do this thought experiment that these are special weasels. So these weasels are racist, sexist, and they also fart a lot. So they emit a lot of greenhouse gases. Um, and then you could ask yourself, mm, is it a good idea to train weasels to tag my photos? Uh, maybe that's not super problematic. Is it a good idea to train weasels to generate memes. Maybe that's also acceptable. But is it a good idea to train weasels to detect skin cancer if people use this to decide to go to the doctor or not? No, that's a bad idea. Or is it a good idea to train weasels to scan, scan CVs of job applicants? No, that's a stupid idea. Remember, they are sexist and racist. Or is it a good idea to train weasels to write to drive very heavy vehicles through busy city streets. Yes. No, obviously not. Someone is most likely going to die. Is it a good idea to train humans to drive heavy vehicles through busy city streets? No, someone is going to die. Teach them how to ride a bike. Don't solve problems on the wrong planet with your weasels. And with that, I'd like to maybe finish off as I said, it is likely that artificial intelligence will change the very essence of what free software means. It can either go in the direction of open AI, and basically it would result in software that can't really be studied, and can't really be modified, and can't really be run on your own machine. But we could also try to use the problems that we see with AI and use them to learn what free software should mean in the future. Of course, the code has to be open source. Maybe we can collectively decide to keep software simple. If you have to use machine learning, of course, there are some cool ideas that you can do with it. But make sure that the model and the training data are available. Maybe we can take energy consumption measures. Maybe we can include freedom from discrimination if we talk about user freedom. And maybe all software has to pass the weasel test. And with that, I would like to add, if we rethink what free software means, then maybe we can truly create AIs that benefit everybody equally. Thank you. Are there any questions? Please, no technical questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in that case, um, uh, yeah, I um, wanted to um, uh, say, first of all, really great presentation and uh, really highlights a lot of problems of AI and stuff, so really enjoyed it. Um, and then my question is like, um, you talked about like uh, solving some of the problems, like for example, when it came to uh, screen blurring and all, all that. Um, you talked about um, solutions such as like simplifying things or even like hiding the features uh, that uh, uses AI and, and stuff. And you also talked about energy consumption. But um, one thing I thought a bit was a bit missing was the um, focus on uh, optimizations. So if you, um, I think there are ways and there are people working on on, on those ways to uh, optimize it so that the energy consumption is much reduced, especially for uh, things that are very common, like such as blurring the video. Yeah. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask, uh, is there a specific reason that you were not focusing a lot on the on optimization, which, which I think would be a, a great solution if, if it can be deployed, right, for, for those problems? Yeah, the reason is 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we also at Nextcloud are very proud of some of the performance improvements we did. Interestingly, we thought that that would also reduce energy consumption of our servers. Uh, sadly, that's not the case because people just click around much more.
So if a page loads three times faster, then people start loading three times more pages, mm -hmm. which is a little bit sad. But of course, optimization of existing features is important as well. So do we have more questions? Not all at the same time. <laughs> no. <laughs> But I just wanted to, to intervene and say that there will be sort of a few closing words down in Palmstedt uh, at the last session, since uh, this room is empty. Uh, and give a big thanks to Daphne. Thank you. Thank you.